Well, we're gathered here to talk about a piece of fiction that's uh, posing as fact. You know, we have a lot of fact that poses as fiction, but this is a very strange topic. Most of you, I assume, have, if not read, I certainly heard about a, the number one novel on the bestseller list by Dan Brown called The Da Vinci Code. And uh, it's a novel. And there's an expression in our language, giving the devil his due. <laughs> well, in this case, we're <laughs> we probably need, need to give the devil his due in the sense that he's done a very skillful job at creating a page turner. And, uh, but it's 454 pages as a diatribe against Jesus Christ, the church, and things that you and I hold dear. But uh, for a number of reasons, um, we've gotten lots of questions. And uh, even though it's a, piece, it's, a, it's a novel, a piece of fiction, there are ways it poses as fact, and it's causing a lot of confusion within the body of Christ and also in the fringes where people know a little bit but not enough to protect themselves from these things. So The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, and uh, obviously a skillful writer, but also a deceitful writer, and one that has an agenda. And uh, he, his uh, novel leans heavily on uh, several books that were published by Michael Bajant, Richard Lay, and Henry Lincoln back in 1982, the main one called The Holy, Holy Blood and Holy Grail, which purports to have serious history upon which he leans very heavily. And uh, I should mention, that since this book comes up a lot in our discussion, Bajant is actually has an undergraduate in psychology. He's pursuing a master's degree in mysticism and religious ex existence. <laughs> Experience, uh, religious experience, and uh, Lee, uh, 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 Richard Lee, is uh, a novelist primarily and a writer of short so stories. The, so, <clears throat> a writer of short stories. So this is the kind of historians that we're, that Dan Brown is leaning on. And uh, the third author, uh, Henry Lincoln, is a BBC scriptwriter, and in fact, in recent interviews, is trying to distance himself from the work of his two co-authors, but. Uh, what, the name of the principal author, or in fact two principal authors, are actually used by Dan Brown in anagrams within his, uh, his novel. But his novel has just spawned a whole cottage industry of books about it. And um, there are many, many books uh, uh, that uh, deal with it or related topics. And uh, there are excellent rebuttals to most of it. This is one of those projects in which my problem wasn't so much finding things out as much as sorting through the abundance of information. Because it turns out that Dan Brown, almost everything in there is wrong. Some of it he's just misinformed, others he's deliberately twisted for purposes of a storyline, which could in some sense might be forgiven. But there's also, it's also very clear that he has an agenda, an anti-Christian agenda. And uh, we'll be dealing with some of that as we go. Because of my PhD thesis and, and also the book published, uh, Cosmic Codes, Hidden Measures from the Edge of Eternity, which has become, a, in some respects, a definitive text in biblical cryptology, we obviously have many questions directed to us for reactions about the Da Vinci Code, so many so that we decided to actually formalize the presentation on it. So we're going to do this in two sessions. We're going to talk a little bit about Dan Brown's book on the presumption you have not read it, talk about the key players the strange adversaries that make up the plot, and some of the deliberate deceits. We couldn't possibly even list the deceitful steps in it. There are books that try, and they're very, very voluminous. But we will focus on the central issues as best we can because that affect you and me. And uh, so this book, of course, as many of you may have heard, is a very fast-paced thriller. And it has a very exotic mix of secret societies and mysterious assassins and intrigues involving famous historical, uh, historical figures such as da Vinci and others, and, and also some controversial institutions. And what's interesting, how he has woven together a whole series of secret codes and riddles that the reader is anxious to figure out. In fact, it's 105 chapters, but they're very short chapters. And you get into a chapter, it's almost hard not to go to the next one because he's very skillful at, at weaving uh, a number of interlaced tales. So uh, as a craftsman, he's excellent. As a historian, he's very clumsy. 
but as a, 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 a human being, he is deceitful and has an agenda against Christ and his church. So one of the reasons we're dealing with this because the main storyline involves what's probably the most outrageous conspiracy theory that anyone can imagine. We all seem to love conspiracy theories, whether we agree with them or not, they make fun discussion and stories. But this one is probably as off the wall as you can imagine. So the key players, of course, the first thing, it opens with the, the head of a curator of the most famous uh, museum in Paris, the Louvre. He's murdered. And he, as he realizes he's about to be murdered, he pulls a painting off the wall, which he knows sets the alarm to shut all the doors. So he, uh, that he thought that would keep the guy from getting at him, but he still was able to kill him. And so he realizes that he has just a matter of minutes before he's dead. So it gives him an opportunity to try to leave a message. And so he, he adopts the posture of the famous sketch by da Vinci called The Vitruvian Man in the hopes that the people coming would recognize it. And he also leaves a message in blood calling their attention to a guy that he was going to have a meeting with. The, the, apparently the top occultic symbologist from Harvard is in town to have a meeting with him. Robert Langdon, that's our hero of the story. So he's, he asks, he, there are several cryptic things that he leaves. And so when the police find him, of course, they track Langdon down and have him come in. And, they all, and so Robert Langdon, this occult symbologist, an expert on uh, occult symbols, is the, the, the key player. And uh, they also bring in the top cryptologist for the French equivalent of the FBI, a gal. But she recognizes more up here than Langdon realizes, and she realizes that he's actually not just an expert being consulted, he's a key suspect. And she has a very clever way of tipping him off, and they realize that, uh, that they have to solve this crime before Interpol and the police do, or they're going to be in big trouble. And so the whole thing becomes sort of a chase, because one clue leads to another clue. There's a whole chain of clues that in, uh, the first few involve clues within the Louvre. And that's where the novel gets its name because they lean on da Vinci as, as the lead in there. Later in the story, they encounter an expert, a guy by the name of Lee Teabing. And this guy is explaining a lot to them about the Bible and what really happened in history. And he's the so-called expert through which the novelist communicates um, all kinds of things and, and substantial misstatements of facts. Teabing, by the way, happens to be an anagram of one of the authors of the books that Dan Brown is leaning on, The Holy Blood and Holy Grail, by Richard Lee and Michael Bajan and Henry Lee back in 82. And uh, Lee is one, uh, Lee Teabing, his first name is taken from the, one of those, and the last name is, uh, is ba basically an anagram. Teabing is an anagram of uh, Bajan. So this is all through the book, there are key anagrams and twists and things that are part of the story. It's also laced with all kinds of other little things like that that intrigue the reader that's sensitive to it and, uh, and, and creates, of course, background. Now, the basic theme of this, the story she opens with this murder, leaving these enigmatic clues in the form of codes of all kinds. The codes typically, the early codes especially, involve Leonardo da Vinci's paintings that are hanging in the, in the Louvre. And uh, so they have to... Uh, 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 solve these clues. And uh, many of these clues involved hidden sketches and uh, elements, cryptic elements in Leonardo da Vinci's paintings. And of course, that's where the novel gets its name. Now, these codes involve all kinds of esoteric symbols. We're going to quickly get into some of that. It involves, in a couple of cases, some Hebrew atbash transpositions. It's interesting that, the, 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 in other words, the knowledge of the writer is substantial. Uh, not as thorough as it should be, but at the same time, he's, he, he's skillfully using many things that are legitimate, uh, uh, Hebrew atbash transposition being one of them. He introduces the concept of a cryptex. A cryptex is a contraption typically consisting of some wheels, and if you put the right code in the wheels, it'll open to reveal the parchment or the, no, the in information inside. If you try to force it or don't do it right, it self-destructs. And uh, uh, the simple, the ancient version of this, presumably, is a parchment wrapped around a, gla a delicate glass cylinder of vinegar. And if the cylinder breaks, the vinegar dissolves the parchment. And so that's the, it, it, so they, they actually 
not only find a cryptex, they find a cryptex inside a cryptex. And, and anyway, he, uh, so that the, the, uh, the writer is able to hook these things all together, just get you entangled and entranced in the whole thing. And, uh, but all through the book, there are hidden meanings behind classic art, as I've just mentioned, also ancient crypts. There, there's some tombs and other things that are very important. And also architecture. It the, 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 the leans a great deal on ar uh, architecture, famous cathedrals, and so forth, as, as though they have part of the, these hidden meanings. Anyway, in Hebrew, as many of you may know from our uh, other studies, there, is, there are at least two, there's actually several, but there's two forms of encryption in the Bible. One is called album, where you take the Hebrew alphabet and fold it back on itself and then transpose letters. Instead of the Aleph, you use the Lambda, et cetera, and, or the Lambda, I should say, and so forth. And that's one, if you fold, if you reverse the fold back, that's, uh, by, incidentally, this, this form of encryption is used in Isaiah 7, 6, uh, and, and some other places. Uh, atbash is a term used where you fold the letter the, it back on itself, so the, 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 the layback is backwards. And the same kind of concept, though, you basically use transpositions. For every letter you're trying to trans, you, you, put, you put the other one. In, Isaiah 20, uh, in uh, Jeremiah 25 and 51, we find this used. Uh, Shishak is a synonym, in effect, for Bab Babylon. And uh, in Jeremiah 51, uh, Leb Kemai is uh, the heart of my enemy, is a tr transcription of uh, Chaldeans, in effect. Not a big deal, but among students of, crypt, uh, of secret writing, these are classic historical references. And it's clear they're in the Talmud and elsewhere, and it's clear that the author somehow became acquainted with that because he uses some of, he tries to adapt that in his story. And the crypt text, I think I've mentioned to you, is simply a container uh, with a series of coded wheels, which opens if the correct code is set, but self-destructs if you try to open it in other ways. But the main issue that we're facing here is that this novel presents itself, in one sense, as historical fiction. It's just a novel. It's just fiction. But this historical fiction is sort of, in some respects, an oxymoron. Because, and of course, uh, it's, inter it's entertained us ever since the early days. The earliest ones we have are Homer, Homer's, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Even today, they're making movies of Troy and so forth that are really adaptations of Homer's classic tales from way, way back, eighth, what, 8th century BC and so forth. And that's often reviewed, historical novels are often viewed as a sugar-coated way of uh, getting a glimpse of history. We love stories. And the story can be embedded in a historical context by diligent research on the part of the novelist. They can be very entertaining and also very fruitful to get a feeling for what that particular period was like, whether it's one of the ancient empires or the early revolution or whatever period is uh, of interest. But see, all that presumes that the thread of the fictional story is entwined in the tapestry of competent historical research. This novel is not entwined in competent historical research, not just because it's faulty, but it's deliberately twisted to present lies and deceit. And that's why it, that's where we're meeting here. So even though it poses as a work of fiction, it poses as if it's based on fact and actual historical events. And the reason we're concerned about it, it promotes a theme includes a, ba a blasphemous heresy, and it also relies on distortions drawn from pseudo-biblical texts. And so it's challenging. Many, many Christians who are just not sound in their biblical background and certainly clearly offends anyone that has a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, in fact, I have to say it astonishes me. I can understand people not accepting Christ. I can understand people having doubts. I can understand people not wanting to join the issue. But it astonishes me that people are willing to commit themselves to an attack on the one who rules the universe and before whom they will be called to judgment. Um, it astonishes me that they're willing to gamble their eternity that there's no chance the Bible is true. I mean, that's a dumb call, no matter how you put it. Anyway, let's move on. There are serious issues raised by this book. Who is Jesus is the main one. And that's a serious issue. That issue, by the way, is raised in other places than here. Even Mel Gibson's fabulous work called The Passion, which we applaud. 
Some people feel it's a little too Catholic. I don't find it offensive at all. I think he's done a marvelous job in many ways. And yet, even it doesn't present who he was. See, that's the real key issue. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is he really? Another question that comes up as you read this book, are the documents of the New Testament reliable? That's the major, a major part of the attack by this novel. You say, well, so what? It's just a novel. How, how does it all affect us? It's just a novel, isn't it? And it's not that simple. And here's why. One of the reasons. When you open the book, one of the first things you're greeted with is a fact sheet before the novel even begins. It precedes the story, and it purports to be an information page that is, is the facts upon which the novel presumably is, uh, is uh, written. The problem is that it's this, pa this page alone causes confusion and concern. Let me, let's just go through. It's just three paragraphs. Fact. The Priory of Zion, it's a European secret society founded in 1099, in other words, before the Crusades, is a real organization, it says. In 1975, Paris's Bibliotheque Nationale discovered parchment known as Les Dossiers Secrets, identifying numerous members of the Priory of Zion, including Sir Isaac Newton, Botticelli, Victor Hugo, and Leonardo da Vinci. Well, that grabs you right away. Wow, because that, that apparently is true, and that's what the story is going to be about. Except it isn't. Next paragraph says the Vatican prelature, known as Opus Dei, is a deeply devout Catholic sect that has been the topic of recent controversy due to reports of brainwashing, coercion, and a dangerous practice known as corporal mortification. Opus Dei has just completed construction of a $47 million national headquarters at 243 Lexington Avenue in New York City. And it has. This organization does exist. It, I wouldn't characterize it the way they have. They sort of portray this organization as sort of a Vatican mafia. In fact, the assassin in the tale, ostensibly, is an operative of Opus Dei trying to um, gain the secrets of, uh, of the Priory of Zion. That's part of the plot. Then the third paragraph that greets you in this front piece, it says, all descriptions of artwork, architecture, documents, and secret rituals in this novel are accurate. So you get the impression, of course, that this frontispiece is a sort of a preparation for the fictional story that follows. But it's something you, you, you can rely on. Well, unfortunately, this last sentence, among all, many others, is not true. The description of artwork, architecture, and, and secret rituals and documents are not true. In fact, they're deliberate frauds. And Dan Brown knew they were frauds. This is a direct attack on Christianity. The author has twisted history to suit his purposes. He relies on falsified documents of disputed origins. That, uh, so with these, the author challenges the, reality of the, the reliability of the Bible, the true nature of Jesus Christ, the origin of Christian beliefs, the realities within the early church, and the role of the so-called lost books of the Bible, and many spurious heretical attempts to undermine the Gospels during the first century. And uh, that's one reason we want to talk about this, because this challenges our understanding of what really happened in the first, second, and third centuries of modern history. Now, first, I want to, I guess you get the, you understand this is an atten intentional attack on Jesus Christ personally and on his church. Now, this became particularly apparent when Dan Brown was interviewed publicly on a number of places, such as ABC News Special, and also during his interview on Good Morning America. He made it clear that he really believes this, and he's, he, he was unabashedly following an agenda here. His intentions are clearly deliberate and targeted. This is not a question of a guy doing shoddy homework that got people confused. He's done his homework to an extent, and he's using that homework to, to undermine the church. Well, what are the questions? Really, you know, the real questions being raised here. Does the Priory of Zion really exist? He presents it as a secret society that created the Knights Templars as its military arm. That's his presentation. What is its agenda, if it does exist? And who really was Mary Magdalene? That's going to be a key issue here, because it presents Mary Magdalene as the wife of Jesus Christ. How do we know that Jesus really wasn't married? How do we really know that? Uh, it leads to the idea of that the offspring led to the, the Merovingian uh, line of kings that uh, dominated uh, what now is known as France from the 5th through the 8th century. And this Merovingian, Merovingian line 
is really still believed and taken seriously by many powerful people in Europe. And it may be one of the dynamics behind the unification of Europe. So even though we, even though we know these stories are blasphemous and untrue, they still are an operative dynamic in the world that greets us. Is it plausible that Mary Magdalene was married to Jesus? And Opus Dei, was it charged with destroying the Priory of Zion to suppress the secrets about the real Jesus? That's the premise that the novels build on. Was there an editorial conspiracy within the early church? Why do we rely on the four Gospels we have? The author presents the idea they were selected from 80 possible ones deliberately tailored to present the myths that you and I embrace as gospel. That's the presentation. How do we know the four that we have are authentic and real? How and wh where were they chosen? And what are these things that we call the Gnostic Gospels? And why were they and the other lost books of the Bible rejected? Who decided? Did Constantine invent the deity of Jesus Christ? He presents the idea that Constantine, when he took over the, the church and, and uh, the empire, promoted Jesus to deity. Up to then, he was just a prophet. That was the, that's the concept. And he's the one that selected the four out of 80 available to really present this kind of a story. Did the Council of Nicaea determine which books should be in the New Testament? That's the impression that gives you. And are the Gnostic Gospels reliable guides to New Testament here, history at all? And if not, why not? And who really did determine what books would constitute the New Testament? And what basis did they do this? These are questions as you read the novel are, are, uh, emerge. Let's get back to this fact sheet to tear it apart. The Priory of Zion, a European secret society founded in 1099, is a real organization, he says here. In 1975, Paris's Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, major library, national library, discovered parchments known as Les Dossiers Secrets, identifying numerous members of the Priory of Zion, including Sir Isaac Newton, Botticelli, Victor Hugo, and Leonardo da Vinci, and others. And, uh, well, let's find out the truth about that. This was not organized in 1099. It was organized in 1956 by Pierre Plantard, the Grand Master, who turns out to be an anti-Semite and has a criminal record for fraud. This was all proven by these documents that were found in the National Library. It turns out this cache of documents uh, that were there were planted there by Pierre Plantard. And this, one of his henchmen uh, confessed. The hoax has been exposed some time ago by a series of books in France and by a BBC documentary back in 1996. So this is commonly known in the European community, but most of it's in French or other languages, so you and I aren't necessarily sensitive to that. The famous persons that are entangled in this story uh, are actually libeled and slandered uh, by the, the, the uh, and, uh, their respect, you know, it's an assault on their memories and reputations. In fact, if I was an attorney responsible for an estate of Leonardo da Vinci, boy, do I have an opportunity to collect. And uh, maybe if there's one in hearing, maybe he'll roll up his sleeves and go after this guy. It would kind of be a very interesting uh, uh, situation. This Priory of Zion that features here is supposed to have created the Knights Templars as its military arm. Now, the Knights Templar are, in fact, the subject of many fables and misunderstandings. You might be interested to know that the, the, the seal of the Knights Templar uh, is the seal of Brother Bertrand de Blancafort, Master of the Temple, the Charter of 27, April of 1168, involves two knights on one horse. That's the symbol of the Knights Templar. They were a brotherhood. They did, get, they did get a lot of, because of their posture as, a, as an order of, of service, they got a lot of donations. And when they were in, the, in Jerusalem uh, during the Crusades, they became very wealthy. That gave rise to the legends that they discovered the temple treasures. And there's all kinds of fables about this that uh, uh, look very unreliable, but they're, they're, they themselves are the subject of many fables and... and, and uh, uh, myths, and uh, so, and some of this even gets tangled. Oh, now the other thing that gets coupled with this thing, uh, of these many legends, is the quest for the Holy Grail. Presumably, they're chasing these the cup that captured the blood of Jesus Christ. That Joseph Arimathea gets tangled up in this thing too. So we have all these legends of the Holy Grail, and they even get tangled up with the King Arthur legends in Britain. So there's much 
folklore and myths that surround the Holy Grail. But, uh, and there are many stories that they, they did get very, very wealthy and they, came, and they were very powerful in Europe with their, because of their finance, financial strength. So much so that King Philip of France, uh, who, was, had a, who was ruling a bankrupt country, accused them to get the, in order to get their lands and money, he accused them of, uh, of uh, Satan worship. And uh, Pope Clement, at first, went along with this until he realized what he was doing, and then even he annulled the trial. It's a, there's a whole thing about this, but the, uh, the, uh, the idea that the Knights Templar are the military wing of the Priory of Zion is just a fiction for, of the author. And by the way, when we were in Ethiopia, it was interesting. One of the things to see in Ethiopia are these elaborate temples built by the Knights Templar, they're known as caves, really, because they're, they're designed to be under the ground. I personally believe they're designed to be concealed as part of what they do. And, and uh, we had a chance to take a look at, uh, see many of them while we were there. And there, if you go to Ethiopia, it's one of the, at Lalabella, it's one of the things you want to see, these elaborate, uh, but they're all below the rock level. They're carved out of the rock deeply. And uh, so uh, it's interesting. We look at the ceiling, you do see the Knights Templar they're clearly, it's their work, and uh, they're also very. It, it, it's, there's visible evidence that they've left at Tanakirkus Island, where the Ark of the Covenant stood for eight centuries. So there's a there are some entwining here, and there's, it's it's worth probably doing some homework. But uh, in 1307, King Philip IV pressed for funds. He used the church, his relationship with the, the Pope, to crush the Knights Templar, accuse them of devil worship, to, and to seize their lands and assets. Most books will accuse Pope Clement V to be part of that. But uh, in fact, uh, when he heard what King Philip had done, he annulled the trial and, uh, and um, uh, suspended the powers of the bishops and the inquisitors involved. But by the time he did that, it was a little too late locally. But in Portugal, Spain, Germany, Cyprus, and most of Italy, the Templars were found innocent and released. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this. You'll find many different accounts uh, to dig into. Jacques de Molay was the last Grand Master and in 1314, he was crucified and then burned at the stake. And uh, there are some that believe that the Shroud of Turin is actually his shroud, not Christ's. But that's a speculation. I'm not going to get into that here. We could spend a lot of time in the Knights Templar, but m the involvement in his book is very peripheral. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Let's get on to the next one. The second paragraph of this sheet that faces the novel is the Vatican prelature known as Opus Dei is a deeply devout Catholic sect. Indeed it is, by the way. It's unusual that it's a prelature of laymen. They aren't priests. It was founded by a priest. But, um, and they are very secretive and very wealthy, and they have completed a $47 million headquarters in New York. They are a real organization. There's no reason to believe they're a, sinister, they're, they're a convenient, sinister adversary to make the novel work. But... Uh, that's uh, uh, probably uh, libelous also. Uh, the Opus Dei stands for the Prelature of the Holy Cross and Opus Dei. Opus Dei means work of God. Founded by a priest in Spain in 1928. It's officially part of the Roman Catholic Church. It really is. It's somewhat secretive, of course. Very wealthy, apparently. Some people regard it as a Vatican Mafia. About 80,000 carefully recruited and indoctrinated members. These are lay members, uh, uh, handled by lay people, by the way. But it's strongly supported by the current pope, incidentally. So. So he's picked a player here that's hard to check out and yet makes the whole thing sound real. There is a website for those of you who want to get into this, opusdie.org. You can check out uh, you know, uh, them if you like. Well, we've gone through Don Brown's book superficially, the players, the adversaries, and some of the deliberate deceits. But he introduces this idea of the Holy Grail with a twist that is not unique to him, but one that deserves some comment. What is the Holy Grail? Most of us have been taught from the legends that it represents a chalice that presumably was at the Lord's Last Supper and that Joseph of Arimathea caught the blood, and there's all kinds of legends about it. Is it that or is it not? And uh, the legends about the Holy Grail are actually, most of them are based on Celtic superstitions. And uh, the word grail is the old French for a cup. That's where the, the Holy Cup is what it implies. But about the fifth century, a twist to this emerges in the, in the folklore that it's not a cup, it's just a, that's a code name. That it's actually a family tree. San Grail, which can mean holy cup, is a homonym, sounds the same as, San Grail, holy blood. And the holy blood, presumably, is the bloodline of, of Mary and Jesus Christ. 
on the presumption that they had children. And uh, this leads then, the Holy Grail here, as used by Dan, Don Brown and others, other writers, is, leads you to what's, what I call the Magdalene heresy. And the Magdalene heresy seems to have surfaced about the ninth century, this idea that the Merovingian kings are descendants of Mary and Jesus Christ. Now, before we get into this too further, you also need to understand there's lots of confusion about Mary. Which Mary? We did a little article in our newsletter, Mary, Mary, quite contrary. In other words, uh, she's not at all as represented. There's obviously Mary, the mother of Jesus, over at deif obviously deified by the Catholics and neglected by the Protestants, and truth lies obviously between those two extremes. There's Mary, the mother of John Mark, and very prominent in the Jerusalem church. She's related to Barnabas. Her large home was used for assemblies, and there's mention of servants and so forth. So she's, that's another Mary. Mary's a common name in that area. There's Mary of Bethany, sister of Martha and Lazarus. And she's, remember, various contrasted with her sister Martha. Many people confuse her with Mary Magdalene. No relationship at all. And uh, she's remembered for her memorial of uh, anointing that's mentioned in John 12, Mark, uh, Matthew 26, and Mark 14. What causes further confusion, in Luke there's an incident, also in the home of a Simon, but it's not in Bethany, it's in Galilee. And Simon in Galilee is a Pharisee. The context is very different. Here, they're among friends. In Galilee, they're among, there's tension and disdain. So it's a to many people confuse the two because they're both anointing. A gal comes in, 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 uh, in the uh, Luke account. There's reason to suspect she's a prostitute. We know that she's a, you know, a woman that has, that about which he should have you know, been sensitive is the pre premise. And very, quite in contrast. Um, that one is even further complicated because that one is usually associated with Mary Magdalene through error. Then there's Mary, mother of the James, uh, uh, James and Joseph, and uh, Mary of Rome who moved to Rome, just a brief mention in, Paul, in uh, Paul's Roman epistle. And then, of course, Mary Magdalene, the one that we're primarily focusing on. Mary Magdalene, she's named after the city from which she came, Magdala, which is, a, is on the northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, on the horns of Hetton, there's, a, it's the, there's a two cliffs there through which winds come that can create quite a turbulence on the Sea of Galilee. But in any case, that's where she's from. We do know from two references that she was healed by Jesus Christ of seven demons. We don't know that there was, you know, what, what else was involved. There's no reason to believe she's a prostitute or anything like that. We do know from the scripture that she's a person of means. She's a leader among the women. And she's often confused with the other Marys by various writers, including Dan Brown. There's no reason to identify her with Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. In 591, Pope Gregory the Great gave an Easter sermon in which he erroneously declared that the prostitute of Luke 7 was Mary Magdalene of Luke 8, because two chapters are adjacent to each other. And uh, there was some confusion about that among some scholars. But in 1969, amazingly enough, the Vatican corrected centuries of misrepresentation and acknowledged that there was no basis for identification, her, for identification um, uh, 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 of her as a prostitute. And so, uh, not that that's a big deal, but I just want to clarify. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion about Mary Magdalene. She was healed of evil spirits, Luke 8 tells us. She was following Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. She was one of those beholding the crucifixion from a distance in Mark 15. She was standing by the cross in John 19. She's, she helped them locate the tomb in Matthew 27. She's watching the tomb in Matthew 27. She came early to the tomb with spices. She was among those first to see the Lord. And uh, she reported the resurrection of the disciples. So she's a key player. And uh, now legends began to circulate in southern France in the ninth century linking Mag Mary Magdalene with the pagan goddess Isis and some other strange ideas. Their myths also included John the Baptist, whose successor presumably was the Gnostic sex magician Simon Magnus, he do who does not show up, by the way, in uh, Acts chapter 8. But all these are just myths that show up in France. Um, and uh, Now, Dan Brown leans heavily. He are, you, you get the impression in the novel that the Gnostic gospel, one of which is the gospel of Philip, supports this idea Mary Magdalene was, uh, had a sexual relationship with Jesus Christ. 
In the Gospel of Philip, which is the Gnostic Gospel, it's the only one that has anything to do with any of this, there is a case where there's a kiss, but there's text missing. It's implied in the text that he kissed many of his other students. It was a holy kiss. But on that one word, they're trying to create the idea that there's a sexual overtone. There's no reason to assume that. There's nothing about marriage or even a sexual innuendo of any kind. In fact, Dan Brown says, makes an allusion, allusion, an allusion to the original Aramaic, which is pretty silly because the Gospel of Philip was not in Aramaic. It was in Coptic. It came from Egypt. But not only that, the word involved is a Greek loan word. And guess what the Greek loan word that's causing all the fuss is? The word koinonia, which means companion or friendship or fellowship or communication has nothing to do with being a spouse or even no sexual innuendo in it at all. So it doesn't mean spouse, as, as, as Dan Brown tries to connote here. All of this is irrelevant anyway because the Gospel of Philip is a third century document 200 years after Jesus. It's not a gospel. It's an op-ed piece. It's, a, it's an expression of some opinions. We'll get to the, gospel, the Gnostic Gospel shortly. Second Peter Peter's second letter warns us of this. He says, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, and this is certainly full of them, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow the pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. That's what we're seeing here, right here in our day. And through covetousness, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. And that's exactly what he's doing, covetousness. He's making millions of dollars because the general public doesn't understand what they're reading. With feigned words make merchandise of you. That's what, that's what Peter's talking about here. Well, first of all, this whole idea that Jesus was married. He tries to paint the, he, they, they, they contrive all kinds of arguments which make no sense anyway, but the main point is there's no evidence whatsoever in fact, it's rebutted specifically in the Bible in some surprising ways. I won't take you through all of that. There's one, 1 Corinthians 9 is your best thing. Paul is there talking to the apostles and the leadership that, it's, that, that they're entitled to be married. Just because he and Barnabas aren't isn't any reason they can't be. What's interesting, if Jesus was married, he would have used that as his argument. He doesn't. It's, 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 it, when you read the passage, it's pretty clear that Paul is well aware of the fact that Jesus is not married, or he would have definitely clinched his argument with that, that reference. That's one example. This whole idea that's promoted here reveals a lack of understanding as just to who Jesus Christ really is. And that's the, that's, that's the, 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 the central thing. And by the way, can Jesus be married? He is going to be married. To the one to whom he's committed. And only those who accept his invitation will gather to enjoy the feast, right? The marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19. Let's be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And it's not Mary Magdalene. At least not alone. She may be part of the picture. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in white, fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And so it goes. So, let's focus on the kenosis. Key passage in the Philippian letter by Paul. Paul to the Philippians, chapter 2. Wherefore God has also highly exalted him, Jesus Christ, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That was written in Paul's day, centuries before all these other, this other nonsense surfaces to, to try to create doubt of that. But this heresy of Magdalene and Christ leads to another theme that's important for us to understand, if for no other reason than there are powerful people in the world today that believe it's true. The Merovingian line. The Merovingians were a dynasty of Frankish kings from the 5th through the 8th century. Franks were basically German derivatives that later become French, so to speak. So uh, uh, in the, uh, 
They descended according to the tradition from Merovec, the chief of the Salian Franks, whose son was uh, Childeric I and whose grandson was Clovis I, the founder of the Frankish monarchy, who died in 511, 511 AD. Now, and we, uh, we're not gonna, I'm not going to take you through all the kings. Uh, these books uh, are full of all the, a lot of uh, their detail. But there's some th interesting things about this you should know. First of all, they're also known by some authors as the long-haired kings. And they also appear, for whatever reason, to identify themselves with Samson, who was the principal player from the tribe of Dan. That's apparently why they had the long hair. And something else, we'll talk a little bit about the tribe of Dan before we're through here. We're going to talk about some things that Dan Brown hasn't uh, brought up, but that is peripheral to this, and yet uh, germane. The, the tomb of Clovis I, when opened many years ago, um, they discovered in it, apparently, some 300 gold bees. Bees are presumably, apparently, a symbol of the tribe of Dan because the key player in Dan was Samson, and you remember the key event there was his riddle that had the bees and the lion and so forth. So bees are associated with Samson and thus become one of several symbols that are associated with the tribe of Dan. So much so that, well, let's see, maybe I've got a slide on that here. Um, and this, by the way, the Merovingians are called the first race of the kings of France. But um, the, uh, the allegation that they descended from the union of Jesus and Mary, of course, lacks any credible evidence. And uh, there are those, though, that point out that the lineage of the Merovingians does link to all the major tri uh, 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 families, royal families in Europe. All the royal families of Europe can, one way or another, trace themselves back to the Merovingians, interestingly enough. And so it's belief in these legends that apparently lie behind some of the activism towards a new Europe. We want to be alert to that. Not that it's true, but people believe it's true. But uh, okay, we've, talk, we've talked a little bit here about um, the Holy Grail, the Magdalene heresy, and the Mer Merovingian line. Let's get back to Leonardo da Vinci. He's been um, <coughs> libeled by this whole thing. Leonardo da Vinci. The first code in the book, of course, was when the curator is murdered. He's able to leave a cryptic code that launches the chain of other things. He, had he, he strips naked and adopts the pa pattern of what's called the Vitruvian Man. You've, always, you've probably have seen this in many places. It's used often. It's a very famous sketch and uh, associated, of course, with da Vinci. And thus, this leadoff is what gives the novel its name. And, and, and thus has impugned the reputation of our friend Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was illegitimate. He was born April 15th of 1452 in Vinci, Italy. Da Vinci is the city, the, the village he came from, not his last name. It's become his last name, of course. He spent 20 years serving Lodovicchio, the uh, Duke of Milan. In 1495, among other things, he was commissioned to do the Last Supper, to... to to uh, entertain the bishops that, A, it was a cafeteria, and it would be up there uh, for the, the refectory of the Dominican monastery in Santa Maria della Grazia. And uh, so many of you, if you've had a chance to if, if visit there or cer certainly have seen pictures of it, um, what, uh, what the author tries to do, he makes da Vinci a member of the Priory of Zion, which is contrived, and, and he argues that there's cryptic codes in the painting. He does this with several paintings, but let's just take this one apart a little bit. The main point is, uh, who's sitting at the right of Jesus? Have you ever noticed this? If you look closely, it looks like a woman. And he's uh, uh, Dan Brown argues that uh, da Vinci was indicating that Ma that's Mary Magdalene. And uh, as, as not only there, but uh, sort of the leader that he, he expected Mary Magdalene to run the church. <laughs> later, and so forth. He builds a whole thing on this. And uh, now, in a, as a practical reality, da Vinci was uh, rendering John the way most Florentine painters did in those days, as a sort of a feminine kind of guy. That's, a, that's an image, for some reason, that they have attributed to John, the, the apostle, which is actually non-biblical, because you may remember that John and his brother were called the Sons of Thunder. They weren't little feminine, you know, mama's boys. They were tough guys. They drove Harley-Davidson motorcycles. 
or their equivalent in those days. But anyway, that was the, the Renaissance image, and that's what the, and she was doing. Something else, by the way, a couple other things they point out. Where's the chalice? Where's the Holy Grail? They use that argument that she is the Holy Grail. There's no chalice on the table, it happens. And uh, the other thing they try to say that da Vinci actually composed it. There's an M, they argue, geometrical motif. Do you see the M there? Well, you know, Dan Brown does and, uh, uh, for Magdalene, see? And there's a lot of other little things that are even more contrived, but that's the kind of thing that the novel tries to lean on to try to entangle da Vinci and some of the other classic people in this myth or this uh, legend of the Magdalene heresy. And so uh, I won't spend more time on that. Um, one thing you should understand, let me just back off, I'll back off to get that M out of there. Um, clearly, the artists, uh, the people who understand art, and I've looked through several of them, all say the same thing. Da Vinci was not interested in church doctrine anyway. It was not his thing. What was his thing was people and their reactions. And what he focused on here was the shock. Jesus has just announced he's going to be betrayed. And that theme is in every gesture and look throughout the painting. That's what uh, da Vinci uh, loved to, to deal with. And uh, so... Uh, now, there is a question that people often point out. Do you know what was said just before this instant? Everybody who wants to be in the picture, get on this side of the table. No, I'm being, I'm being facetious here. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, let's move on. Mona Lisa figures very casually in this, but there's all kinds of myths that Dan Brown promotes about it. Uh, it's a self-portrait, or is, is it a self-portrait? Is it a mistress? Is it some male lover? All these myths are nonsense. Um, they now think it to be Lisa Garadini, uh, a wife of a friend. Um, there is a, um, Leonardo did not name this painting. In fact, he didn't finish it because of some, it, apparently people originally found it, didn't want it, and so he worked it over and worked over over the years. Um, it isn't even called the Mona Lisa until a, a long time later. It shows up in uh, a book called Lives of the Artist for the first time as uh, Mona Lisa. But anyway, so it's very fabled because it's, at their, there are enigmatic aspects to it. One that does come up in the book is Virgin on the Rocks. And this painting is full of quirks that, is pu that have puzzled uh, artists for years. A lot of quirky details in this. What you need to understand, there were disputes, not just with Leonardo, but several other artists with the nuns that committed it, uh, commissioned it. And they were very specific in what they wanted. And part of what's going on here is Leonardo is giving what I would call malicious compliance. That's what they want, that's what we're going to get, but he's going to do it in a way that won't satisfy him. This ends up becoming a debate, not just for him, but these other artists with their things too. A dis extended dispute over the specifications the nuns made, the terms of payment. It finally leads to 15 years of arbitration. So much of this, and I won't go through the details here, but there are some quirky things about it. And uh, even the, the angel there has got a smirk on his face. There's a lot about it that looks as if it was deliberately trying to get the nuns upset. <laughs> and they probably was. So uh, it certainly doesn't uh, support the thing. Let's get to more substantive issues. Constantine, the emperor of the world and the Council of Nicaea. Brown assumes that Constantine made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire. A lot of people think that because they're sloppy. No, that, he did not do that. He simply granted freedom of worship in his Edict of Milan, Edict of Tolerant, Toleration, 313. Theodosius, the, his second successor after him, is who made Christianity the state religion. What Constantine did do, he encouraged members of his court to become Christians. And lots of debate about Constantine, and most of the things that da Vinci presents about him are not true. He actually has quite a record of positive contributions he made. He got rid of gladiatorial flight, fights. He made one day and seven a day of rest, which was fabulous for the slaves because they'd never had that. Uh, and on and on and on, he made a whole bunch of reforms. But Brown's Constantine, Brown says he upgraded mortal, a mortal Christ to deity, which is utter rubbish. He secured male dominance and the suppression of women. Part of the theme that goes through here, and I have not d decided to dwell on that here, there's a strong uh, feminist theme 
through here that, that, uh, that the church suppressed women, which is just not true. Women have uh, materially benefited. Uh, they're far suppressed more before Christ than after. And, uh, but he paints, it, he paints that picture that this whole thing was a church trying to assure male dominance when really Mary Magdalene was going to be the one. See, he plays on that not only for the heresy, but also to attract the feminist uh, marketplace. Brown's Constantine's converted the world from matriarchal paganism to patriarchal Christianity, which is nonsense. It's not true, obviously. He canonized and selected favorable gospels from more than 80 available, which also is just nonsense. He didn't collect, select any, and there weren't 80 available. It's a, that's a whole, the, the whole thing is twisted. And his versions of the interactions between Christianity and Gnosticism is contradicted by clear records. What we're seeing here is Gnosticism, and it was on the rise, started early in the uh, first, second century. Uh, Irenaeus wrote against heresies, dealing with some of this. And uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Gnostics because, first of all, there are lots of different kinds. It's not as if there was a particular view of the Gnostics. Most of what they embrace is pretty much what we encounter today as New Age stuff. You can be God if you can enter into the you know, uh, various things. So, but the main point is it was uh, Gnosticism was a perversion of Christianity that emerged early. And, uh, uh, and, and Dan Brown's portrayal of that is uh, twisted. The Council of Nicaea is a major council convened in 325 AD with 318 bishops that assembled to settle some disputes about Christology. It's important to understand what the Council of Nicaea was all about. There's a guy named, by the name of Arius who argued that Jesus was a created being. He may have been a sort of a super being, but he was still a created being. Arius was a great communicator. And so he caused deep disputes throughout the empire, so much so they wanted to meet to resolve this issue. And opposing him was a guy by Athanasius who was, uh, he argued for the full deity of Christ, and to make a long story short, he um, prevailed. Arius' books were burned, and he won before it's over. Now what's interesting, Brown's version of this, he says it was at the Council of Nicaea in 325 that church leaders decided by vote to make Jesus divine. Not true. He already had been declared that, in, as we'll see in a minute. And uh, he, uh, Brown's version is that until that moment in history, Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet. Not true. Thomas had a different view about the nail prints in his hand. Just to, uh, we could go on and on. That's just, that's just a twist. That's just not true. And Brown says he was made uh, divine by a close vote. The vote in the Council of Nicaea, by the way, was um, uh, only five out of 318 were dissenting, and only two refused to sign the final thing. So I, I would not say that's a close vote. I'd say it's rather overwhelming, actually. And uh, so if Christ was not fully God, then God was not the redeemer of mankind. That's what comes out of this, and that's something they realized in Nicaea. Remember Colossians 1.16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, Visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Jesus Christ is the creator. And this guy that Brown is attacking is the creator of the universe before whom Brown is going to appear in judgment. Boy, what if they'll sell tickets? That would be interesting. Now, we go through John 1.1, 1, 1, Romans 9.5, Hebrews 1.18. There's dozens of passages. Anyone that has even the, the most superficial grasp of the New Testament recognizes that that presentation of Jesus Christ as God is in the Gospel of John, and it's also understood by his followers from the get-go. That wasn't something that was conjured up later. Now, let's, the Council of Nicaea is 4th century. Let's go back to the 1st century. Before the end of his earthly ministry, his divinity was already being acknowledged. That's why they crucified him, because he claimed to be God. Remember Thomas, my Lord and my God, in, in John 20. And we could go on and on. There's lots of verses that we could deal with. So I'm, I'll, I'll resist the temptation to do that. I, I, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, let's go to the second century. Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, in his writings, which we have, we have, there is one God who manifests himself through Jesus Christ, his Son. He speaks of Son of Mary and Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord, God incarnate, Christ God. That's his language, Ignatius, Church Father, 
second century. In fact, the year 110, just after afternoon. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. His letter to the church at Philippi assumes the divinity of Jesus, his glorification, so forth. By the way, it really startled me to go through and um, track some of these things down. I never realized that Ignatius wrote letters to John. He wrote several to John. I thought, well, that's fascinating. You know, I mean, these guys, there's a whole... I'm not one that leans on early church fathers for doctrine, because they were mixed up by a lot of doctrines we know today. So they're not, they're not an example. The book of Acts is, and the, the New Testament is. But it is fascinating to read these things, to re, give a reality to that period. That's exciting. Now, there's other second century fathers. Justin Martyr, being the first begotten of the word of God, is even God. That's in his first apology, chapter 63. Both God and Lord of hosts, referring to dialogue with Trypho. And uh, Irenaeus, 185 approximately. Again, still in the, you know, second century. Our Lord and God and Savior and King. Who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. In fact, what he's writing about is against heresies. Against heresy. The, the whole passage has to do with the Gnostics and others. Clement of Alexander, in the second century. To, truly most manifest deity that he has made equal to the Lord of the universe because he was his son. Constantine came later, a century later. A century and a half later. Yeah, these are all in the Anton I've seen fathers, 10 volume set. You can check it out. Tertullian is another, he has a whole bunch of writings. Another rebuttal to the Dan Brown premise are the persecutions in Rome. Does Dan Brown, did you understand that Christians were persecuted in those early centuries? Absolutely. Why? Because they were commanded to worship the emperor and they refused to because they worshiped Christ. They, took Christ, they treated Christ as God. See, pagan, paganism has always been tolerant of other finite gods to celebrate the splendor of diversity. We find that expression still in our multicultural context. The martyrdom of the early Christians was voluntary. They chose to be burned at the stake rather than to worship someone other than Christ. Exclusive commitment to Christ as God, not as some great prophet or teacher. In fact, it might be worth it. What came out of Nicaea was the Nicene Creed, which many of you probably have heard or read in the past. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, that is of the substance, Uzias, of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things came to be, those things that are in heaven and those things that are on the earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was made flesh and was made man, suffered, rose the third day, ascended into the heavens, and will come to judge the living and the dead. Nicene Creed, that's what came out of Nicaea. And by the way, they, did not, they didn't talk about what books out of the Bible. The Bible was already nailed down centuries before. So Dan Brown preys upon the average person's ignorance by even dealing with them. The Gospels were selected there. They were selected from more than 80 available. Nonsense. Twenty rulings were issued the Council of Nicaea, and we have all of them. They're in existence. Not one of them involved issues regarding the canon or the, 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 uh, the authorized Bible. Well, we've gone through session uh, th the, through Da Vinci and that. Now, let's talk a little bit about these Gnostic Gospels. Do you know there's other Bibles? I almost brought one, a Gnostic Bible. These are documents that were found in the fourth century that were probably written under pseudonyms fraudulently uh, in the second and third century, third and fourth century, really, most of them. And uh, Gnosticism, it comes from Greek gnosis, meaning knowledge, but it really implies uh, private or secret knowledge, hidden knowledge. And the Gnostic Gospels are treated uncritically by Brown as if they were Gospels. They're not Gospels, by the way. Gospels are histories, facts, with facts you can check out. The four Gospels have facts in them you can check out. These are not Gospels. They call themselves Gospels. They're really editorials, op-ed pieces. And they're written under pseudonyms. Why written under pseudonyms? To give them credibility the writer didn't have. And they were done centuries after the fact. So they had no credibility, even when, they, even when they came out. Now, a number of copies of these things were found at an Egyptian site called Nag Hammadi in Egypt. 
they, and, and the documents there dated from the third and fourth centuries. So it's an interesting find historically, but got nothing to do being a, a, in terms of being authentic documents. Paul wrote to Timothy in his second letter, 4.3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. And that's what the Gnostic Gospels are full of. Gospels contrived to support Gnostic beliefs, which are not biblical. They have no, no authenticity, and the early church recognized them. They never got to first base. There's dozens of these. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Truth. They have all these fancy names. They weren't written by Thomas, Philip, or Mary, or whatever. They pretend to be. They're pseudonyms. And... Uh, they're all, and they're attributed to apostles in order to give their speculations legitimacy, but they're just full of speculations. The early church rejected anything written but on a pseudonym. Such deceptions are inconsistent with divine inspiration credited in the New Testament. The New Testament has been credited with divine inspiration. God doesn't write under pseudonyms. And uh, all of these are written after the gospel period by several centuries. And... Uh, the analogy, of course, would be like someone trying to conjure up a totally different perspective of how, how John F. Kennedy was killed in Dealey Plaza a couple of centuries from now, thinking that, don't you think we'd know more about it than they would? I think so. And uh, because there's, you know, eyewitnesses, all the rest of it. Anyway, um, so these things all contrast with the New Testament accounts, which were eyewitness accounts. And by the way, the Gnostic Gospels make no pretense of being an actual record of events. It's really speculations, uh, mystical speculations. They're anti-historical rather than simply non-historical. It's not that they're not based on history. They're actually contrary to history that's known. So why are they accepted at all? Why are these things even today embraced by some people? Not because, they're due, not because of any serious historical research, that's for sure. There isn't a single verifiable fact in any of them. It's simply a fable that some have chosen to embrace. I love what Napoleon said. What is history but a fable agreed upon? That's his view. And there's a sense, in a psychological sense, a sense that's true. History is what people believe it is. And that's what's so tragic about our present uh, environment here in America. We have people running for office. Uh, our military cemeteries are filled with patriots who died fighting everything they stand for. And the average American has no grasp of our heritage. So what is history but a fable agreed upon? Napoleon has a, there's a cynicism that's probably true. Spirit of our times, doctrinal diversity. We're supposed to tolerate everybody, even the people that want to kill us. And of course, the pressure of feminism. God was really a woman, and, and so forth. The main thing is people are looking for a do-it-yourself religion. And uh, that's an... It, it, this idea of forgeries was not limited to the 2nd, 3rd, 4th centuries after. It even occurred during Paul's lifetime. 2 Thessalonians was written to rebut a letter that was being circulated at that time that was purporting to be from Paul. You won't understand 2 Thessalonians until you understand that Paul was putting down the, uh, some upsets. These guys, the, the Thessalonians are really upset. And Paul is quieting them down. You need to understand... When you read his letter, you can figure out what was upsetting them. It's very important. Now, we'll get into all that here, but uh, I often call 2 Thessalonians 3rd Thessalonians. There's 1 Thessalonians, the forgery, and then when Paul wrote. We call it 2 Thessalonians. Okay. Paul says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not so soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by a letter as from us as that day of Christ is at hand. And it all has to do with eschatology. One of the most important passages in end-time prophecy is the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. So it's important for you to study. But again, he's responding to a forgery. And later on in the letter he says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when, when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, 
And ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So that's our first session on this. I want to take some other topics when we get into the, uh, the uh, next hour. But it's interesting that we have this heresy in our laps or in our, in our, uh, in our culture. There are many people offended by this. It's actually a blessing. It's actually a blessing, strangely enough, in an elliptical way. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 19, he says, There must needs be heresies among you, so that that which is approved may be made manifest. Most of us probably would not do much homework on the origin of our Bible and the rejection of the Gnostic Gospels and the councils of the early church, except for these kinds of things. This is driving many Christians to do the homework they should do in the first place, to find out where do we get our Bible? Why do, how do we know that the, the four Gospels we have are really the four that are important? Was there a fifth or sixth or seventh that we probably should be paying attention to? <coughs> is there something special going on here? There definitely is. And one of, the, one of the things, you really need to understand why we emphasize so strongly that, first of all, the Bible we have is an integrated message. Uh, one of the things, um, I didn't develop slides on it because I, I was afraid of getting derailed too far down a... A side path. In fact, my biggest problem in putting this briefing together wasn't finding things out. It was sorting through the abundance of information that I had available. Um, and there are many, many really good books on this subject. Uh, Erwin Lutzer has done a book on, on this. In fact, I'm embarrassed. That I didn't realize that uh, we, he, has, he uses the same title we've chosen for this little briefing. But uh, Erwin Lutzer is an excellent communicator, and it's a great little book. Daryl Bach does a thorough research job and, and also uh, is one of the premier uh, books. Richard Abanis has done a book on it. And with excellent little book, but with, he really has done his homework on the backgrounds here. Uh, Richard Abanis is coming out to, turning out to be quite a journalist, quite a historian. He wrote a book some years ago that was quite libelous to me personally. But when he found that out and checked it out, he came to me and made his peace and apologized. Several years ago, we, you know, he had previously was working with Hank Hanegraaff and did a book that was had three or four things that were just patently untrue and libelous about us. And uh, uh, when that was called to his attention, he, he uh, came to me and, uh, and apologized, and, and we made our peace over it. So, and I'm quite intrigued to see the thoroughness with the book that he did on, on, the, on this topic. And uh, there, are, but it, it, there, are, there are many, many really good... So that, our problem isn't lack of resource. The problem is there's, you can make a whole career of going through all this stuff. But the main thing about it, I think, for you and I, is that it should help us focus on understanding why we believe the Bible, why it is what it is. And that's one of the things we're going to take on in the next session. Where do we get the Bible? How do, how do the ones, how do we know the four that we, the Gospels we use are the right Gospels and so forth? But then we're going to do something else in the next session. Um, we're going to um, talk about the things that, uh, the, 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 the hidden codes that are even more pervasive than the ones Brown is dealing with, and we're all going to talk about some things that Brown hasn't told you that you may find extremely shattering and provocative. So we will see you in the next session.